Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth. This is the fifth video, or the sixth when you also count the introduction video, of the secret history of the Jesuits. It's all secret and it's all history that my channel is all about, you think, eh? <laughs> you know, this afternoon I was recording another part of the, sec uh, of the secret history, I just wanted to say, no, no, that's this one, of the history of the Inquisition by Limborch. I do not know when I will upload this part of uh, the reading of uh, Edmond Paris's book, um, but I think that the history of the Inquisition will be uploaded by that time on my second channel, of course, or at least the biggest part of it. And um, the history of the Inquisition is a book from 1692, written by a Dutchman and um, translated in 1731 by Samuel Chandler into English. And it deals really from the beginning of the apostolic times, really in the second, uh, uh, even in the first century with the history, in the first century after, uh, after Jesus Christ's crucifixion with the Apostolic Church, and it takes us through the whole Inquisition time. It is a 470 pages book. It's very interesting to read. It's history that is withheld from us when we go to the school, when we go to the university, and surely when we go to the church, because in the church nobody tells us about an Inquisition. They never tell us that there were people who were called the Huguenots, the Hussites, the Valdenses, the Albigenses, the Lollards, and all the other people that were there that were persecuted through the centuries through the Antichrist of the Bible. And the Antichrist of the Bible, the Pope, ordained in 1540 the Order of the Jesuits. And at Montparis wrote a book about the secret history of this Jesuits, which is actually a secret society. And we are now in section 4, chapter 2, the morals of the Jesuits. But before I start reading, I want you to make acquaintance with a brother in Christ of mine who is joining me today in the recording of the reading of this book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. And it is Brett Norman, who I owe very, very much thanks for all the things that he done for me doing video work during the book All Roads Lead to Rome, where he shows all the pictures that we can, that I could upload that without doing all the picture work. And um, we are doing other, uh, other things together, like uh, this wonderful video, um, This Side Jordan, and uh, probably the Jeremiah 5 by then is also out that I just recorded a few days ago. So I first want to welcome Brett over there in the United States of America to the broadcast today on the 19th of March 2017, a Sunday at uh, half past 8 p.m. my time over here in Europe. Welcome to our reading that we are going to do together, The Secret History of the Jesuits, Brett. How are you Great. doing? Great. Thank you. And you're very welcome for the the uh, photo work that I've been doing with you. And, and it's been a, a pleasure to be a part of it. And I've learned so much from it. And I can only hope that everyone that will take a look at these videos with uh, uh a questioning mind, at least, let's put it that way, you know, if, if anyone's been churched like I have, you know, in America here, uh, certainly uh, there's plenty of doctrines we've learned that we should question. And, uh, you know, certainly ecumenism is a, a major, major wolf in sheep's clothing that has been, you know, uh, accepted and uh tolerated in various forms, perhaps. Hmm? Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is now that I'm reading the uh, history of the Inquisition from Limborch, there you can already see the beginning of ecumenism. Oh, you bet. He even speaks of ecumenical councils within the 4th and 5th century. It's yeah? very, very fascinating. I, I need to listen to those again because... Uh, I think that uh, the more that you submerse yourself into 
history, the closer you can get to that first century church and to Christ and to what he stood for precisely. And those puzzle pieces begin to get solved, to so to speak. You know, you, you begin to start putting the pieces together. Well, Jesus really was a Jew, and he really did witness uh, the uh, Sabbath day, of course, you know. And if we are to be Christians, shouldn't we do the same, you know? And uh, just little questions well, like uh, that, right? Uh, you just you just mentioned the Sabbath, mm -hmm. and uh, today, um, today or yesterday, I felt about something. I, I don't know where exactly, but um, uh, it was about um, this. Uh, I think it was a bishop, Eusebius, mm. who was a so-called church father. You know, in the in the quote unquote church father of the early time, and he was the one responsible. Uh, for introducing the Sunday worship uh, in the Council of Laodicea, which took place, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about 328 uh, after Christ, so in our, uh, our time uh, recording, mm -hmm. which is a few years after the Council of Nicaea, which was the very first council that was called by Constantine. Mm -hmm. After Constantine, after Constantine made quote-unquote Christian the state religion of the pagan Roman Empire. Right. You know, that happened in 321 also with his Sunday law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly the moment that I think we have to recognize when the Bible speaks up um, that uh, first there must come an apostasy. That's right. A falling away. That's right. Before the son of, before the son of perdition, the man of sin the Antichrist will be revealed. That's right. Second Thessalonians you know, that was not, chapter two, right? Yeah, that was not that was not just at the same moment. Mm. Don't understand me wrong, because this was in the uh, fourth century, three hundred twenty something. Right. No, of course. And the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. and the Antichrist only arose to his full power in six oh six. And we know that already now. I studied that a little. That's bit, right. Uh, a little bit deeper. That's now. right. And that was when uh, when uh, uh, the Emperor Phocas gave uh, the Pope at that time uh, the complete power, and he took back the title Pontifex Maximus that he didn't take for a long time. So the 1260 years actually went from 606 to 1866. Yeah. When, when the uh, French protecting guard left the Vatican, and the Vatican was there defenseless. And then in 1870, um, everything, all the papal states were completely confiscated by the Italian Republic and uh, the temporal power of the Pope was completely taken away. Those 1260 years, of course, do not match with the common teaching of the um, Seventh-day Adventists yes, that is taught yes, everywhere the in the world. Revolution. And I know that, but... Yeah, yeah well, uh, they say it's from 538 to 1798, but you know, I think um, there are different dates possible. Uh, 538 to 1798 is possible when you think of it, and, and uh, I think that even from 606 to 1866, we can speak of the spiritual uh, power that was taken away from the Pope at that time. Mm -hmm. And you and I know that the Pope, after that, locked himself into the Vatican until 1929, until the wound was That's restored right. by the Lateran Treaty. Yes, yeah. yes. But um, coming back to what we were talking about, Eusebius, that I that I just learned that he was instrumental in the um, Council of Laodicea in 328 to introduce the Sunday worship. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever you go uh, in that book, The History of the Inquisition, and the different church councils are mentioned, uh, they always come back and say, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea, that is where everything began. And that teaching that was manifested in there, the Catholic dogmas that were manifested in there, are the Catholic dogmas that all other councils later have to adhere to. I don't know by heart, and of course, dear listener, <laughs> you're maybe already a little bit bored because we didn't start the reading here, but I can tell you 
listen to my reading of the history of the Inquisition and there you will see there are different councils where you can see the relation that I also make when I'm reading that book because I don't know it by heart and cannot give you the example right now for the, in detail that um, the Council of Trent from the Jesuits in 1545 was one thing and the Second Vatican Council in uh, 1962, uh, 1963 to 1965 was another and you know at that ecumenical council in the, in the 1960s of last century um, they only confirmed everything that was made dogma and anathema in the Council of Trent 400 years before that time and um, by going through that book, History of the Inquisition, it is the same when you see that one council and that council and that council and they all go back to the Council of Nicaea. Mm. It's actually, actually the same that in all the latter, in all the later councils, the dogmas and the politics and, the, uh, and everything that was decided in the Council of Nicaea is just being confirmed. Mm. Interesting. You see? Yes. So that's that's about the same history that we only knew. I, I, I'd like to say from from the Council of Trent and the Second Vatican Council, but that already is a story that is much longer going on, and that reminds me, of course, of saying, "Well, there's nothing new under the sun." Right, right. There's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. But uh, anyway, that is a very interesting uh, history study to uh, do the reading of that book, uh, The History of the Inquisition by uh, Patrick van Limborch. And I advise anybody who listens to this video to uh, look the playlist up on my, uh, on my YouTube channel. It's on my second YouTube channel, but uh, the playlist will be, um, uh, will be put in the description box of this video also. So you can easily click on that and, and look that up. But uh, now, for now, I would like to start reading the morals of the Jesuits, except, of course, Brett, you have another little remark before we start here. And you know, of course, <laughs> that you are invited to interrupt me at any moment with my reading. <laughs> well, you know my little To remarks. give a comment and that we can discuss this or that a little bit. So yeah. I'm looking forward to that. So do you have... Uh, something that you want to remark for right now or shall i start the reading ah uh, well i do want to remark but i know better let's start the reading <laughs> you know better. <laughs> yeah because you know these little tangents end up in the little fissures and then the fissure just gets bigger and bigger and it becomes a, a long discussion so okay please so then i'm gonna start now with the morals of the jesuits the conquering spirit of their society, the burning desire to attract consciences and hold them under their exclusive influence, could only induce the Jesuits to be more lenient with the penitents than confessors of other orders or the secular clergy. We do not catch flies with vinegar, rightly says the proverb. As we have already seen, Ignatius of Loyola expressed the same idea in different terms, and his sons drew their inspiration from it. Quote, the extraordinary activity deployed by the order in the field of moral theology already shows that this subtle science had, for him, a much greater practical importance than the other sciences. Unquote. From the book of Burma. But I will not always tell you where that citation is taken from you can look that up for yourself it's just a quote from Burma who we already cited numerous times in this book mr. Burma the author continues who wrote the phrase we just quoted so you didn't even need me to tell you that reminds us that confession was very rare during the Middle Ages and the faithful resorted to it only in the gravest cases but the domineering character of the Roman Church made the practice of it spread and grow more and more. In fact, during the 16th century, confession had become a religious duty, which had to be diligently observed. Ignatius considered it most important and recommended, his, uh, and recommended to his disciples that as many of the faithful as possible should observe it regularly now there is a book written from an author that you all probably know Charles Chenequi 
who wrote the fantastic book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome. Charles Chenequy also read and uh, wrote another book that is called The Priest, the Woman and the Confessional. And there is already a chapter out of that that I have read once in one of my broadcasts, An Hour of the Truth. But this book goes too deep as that I could now start reading a little bit of it. It starts with a wonderful preface and Ezekiel chapter 8, at least the first 18 verses of that chapter. And it is a book that I can only put warmly to your heart to read it. Charles Chinnikri. And the book is called The Priest, the Woman and the Confessional. You can get that book for free on the internet as a PDF. And when I think of it, I will put the link that you can download it for yourself, even in the description box of this video. Something that Tom always says, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, when he does his reading and he speaks about the confessional, is that that confessional is the backbone of the Roman Catholic intelligence agency. And we live today in the 21st century where we have so many quote-unquote intelligence agencies. They are all spies. And they all do exactly that, what the priests did throughout the centuries. And because people today do not attend churches anymore, the Roman Catholic Church depends on this quote-unquote intelligence agencies to supply them with the knowledge they would otherwise have gotten through their Roman Catholic priests and their confession box. So, I don't want to go any, any fur, into any further comment mm. here, and I don't think that Brett has something to say, otherwise I would have heard him already. Right, right. Well, I was just thinking, you know, if, if you think in terms of uh, technology, um, this is certainly true, and now we have these supercomputers, and uh, a supercomputer can crunch through loads and loads and loads of data, and it can search for terms, it can search for things. Now, if we digitize all the voices, and then we have uh, speech-to-text conversion, we can search all those terms in all these conversations and you put two and two together and you can figure it out for yourself pretty easy. So uh, that's my only comment. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to continue reading, but I really put it warmly to your attention that you get the book, The Priest, The, Wo the Woman, The Priest and the Confessional by Charles Chenequy and read that. It's not that big a book. The PDF file is about 140 pages. So... That's something you can read through in two or three days. Now, the author continues in The Secret History of the Jesuits at Montparis. Quote, the results of this method were extraordinary. Now, we are speaking about the confessional. Okay? The Jesuit confessors soon enjoyed everywhere the same consideration shown to the Jesuit professors, and the confessional was considered by all as the symbol of the order's power and activity as were the professor, professorial chair and the Latin grammar. If we read Ignatius' instructions regarding confessions and moral theology, we must admit that, from the beginning, the order was prepared to treat the sinner kindly, that as time went on it showed more and more indulgence until his kindness degenerated into slackness. We can understand easily why this clever leniency made them such successful cons confessors. This is how they won the favors of the nobles and high-ups of this world who always needed the condescension of their confessors more than the mass of ordinary sinners. The courts of the Middle Ages never had any all-powerful confessors. This characteristic figure appeared in the life of courts only in the modern times, and it is the Jesuit order which implanted it everywhere. Now, Mr. Burma wrote, quote, During the 17th century, these confessors not only obtained an appreciable political influence everywhere, 
but even accepted and sometimes openly political posts or functions. It is then that Father Neidhardt took the direction of Spanish politics as Prime Minister and Grand Inquisitor. Father Fernandez sat and was entitled to speak and vote in the Portuguese Council. Father Lachaise and his successor held the function of ministers for ecclesiastical affairs at the court of France. Now allow me please that I'm going to do a little bit explanation of who Father Lachaise was. We are speaking of the confessor of King Louis XIV of France. The Sun King, as you probably know him also. This confessor, Father de la Chaise, which is his correct name, de la Chaise, not de la Chaise, de la Chaise, this confessor of Louis XIV got the king, Louis XIV, through the confessional that he learned of his misdoings and his incest with a family member, I think it was his uh, daughter-in-law or, 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 or a stepdaughter that he had sexual relations with, Louis XIV, that he confessed in the confession box that Father de la Chaise said, I cannot forgive you for these things. And with that he put the, queen, the king in such a dilemma that, of course, he could blackmail him. And Father de la Chaise did just that. And he got him so far to revoke the Edict of Nantes. The Edict of Nantes that was introduced in the end of the 1400s by, I think, if I'm not mistaken, King Henry IV of France. And that gave the Protestants in France, especially the Huguenots, freedom of religion the freedom to worship their God, which was and is the God of the Bible, in the way that they wanted to. Father Lachaise blackmailed Louis XIV by saying that he can only be forgiven this venial sin if he revoked the Edict of Nantes and persecuted the Protestants, or as Rome likes to call them, the heretics out of France. That led to a slaughter of thousands and thousands of Huguenots and the fleeing of almost of half a million of those Huguenots into the other countries that surrounded France, not only in the Netherlands, not only Germany, but most and for all, these people went to the Netherlands and to Germany and boarded ships. And do you, my dear American listener, have any idea where these ships were heading to? The New World that part of the world that never saw the gospel and where the Antichrist did not reign and persecute at that time. America. And I think that a lot of my American listeners right now should start thinking about how their country was actually founded. Who founded that country? Who came over? Who were the people who lived in this country? Why did they even come to America? Why are you fleeing your own country? Because of persecution. So all your forefathers of all my American brethren, and I'm talking right now to all your forefathers, except for the few who are Catholic, but you don't listen to me anyway, were persecuted, were chased out of your home and fled to the United States of America. Father de la Chaise 
is only one example of a confessor to a ruler who used the knowledge that this ruler gave him through the confession to blackmail him. This is something that has been taken so far that more than 70 countries in the history of the Jesuit order expelled them because of their meddling with politics, first and for all through the confession box. You have to understand that those were the reasons why the King of Spain, the King of Portugal, the King of France and others expelled the Jesuits from their territory. And this history of Father de la Chaise, you can read about that in uh, Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. Uh, you can read in that, I think, also in Babylon, Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow. I'm not sure about that anymore, but I know I'm sure about um, The Two Babylons and probably other accounts. And there you see why history is so important. Brett, maybe you have a comment here or shall I just continue? Oh yes, uh, I would just simply add that uh, it's, it's fantastic to have your insights, Jörg, from your perspective of being uh, European here in America um, this is one of the huge benefits that I see in what you're doing is because we've been stripped. And so perhaps Europe has too, has been stripped of this history. And, uh, well, from whatever perspective we come at it, we see differently. We see things differently and certainly, you know, I've been to Europe and, uh, when I went to Europe, it really was a shocker because uh, there's just so much to take in so quickly. And, uh, well, that's about all I can say is uh, thank you very much for your insights into this because uh, this is very significant. Yeah, you know, all these things that I've just said is nothing that I've learned in school over here in Europe or in universities or wherever. It's what I got from books mm -hmm. that I only got interested in because I was saved by Jesus Christ. And he told me to look into these things. And uh, it's that spirit that leads me into doing all this research and doing these book readings, which I do not only for my pleasure, but uh, certainly for the pleasure of the Holy Spirit and the pleasure of the people who want to listen to this. That's right. The very important point is that when you go through these books that, you know, you read one book and then you read another and here and there you see things connecting. Mm -hmm. You see the things mentioned in this one book also mentioned in another book and you see the same sources and you see different sources and you go to that sources and you read more mm -hmm. and you go from one source to another and all of a sudden you are caught in a study of history as you have never dreamed of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Brett, mm -hmm. the things start making sense. There we go. You get a picture of this world that you have never, ever gotten before, that you have never, ever dreamed of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it opens up to you. And the most important book in this, of course, is the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because in the Bible... The Bible, especially the New Testament, the last book, the book of Revelation, written by John the Revelator on the island of Patmos in 95 uh, uh, BC, uh, AD, sorry. Right, 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 right. <laughs> AD, uh, Anno, Anno Domini, mm -hmm. is prophecy. Is prophecy of the Church of Jesus Christ. And prophecy is nothing else but history written in advance. So we now today in the year 2017 have the possibility to look back on 2000 years of history of what John wrote in advance and to see how it developed and see how it all came into fruition. Mm -hmm. And that is just so wonderful in studying history. Because it's all worth absolutely nothing without the Word of God, without the Bible. 
But when you understand this history that we are reading here, then you get a picture of understanding of the prophecy even so much better. And I think that is important because, you know, there's only one book in this world that tells the absolute truth, and that's the Bible. The absolute truth is not to be found in the secret history of the Jesuits. The absolute truth is not to be found in All Roads Lead to Rome. The absolute truth is not to be found in the Global Vatican. The absolute truth is not to be found in the history of the Inquisition. The absolute truth is only to be found in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But books like what I've just mentioned, they all confirm that the Bible is the truth. Mm -hmm. And then when you speak of the Bible, then you have the different Bibles. <laughs> and there we go with the next slippery slope of uh, falling into yeah, that, uh, an apostate Bible. That would be another discussion. Oh, I know. That we, maybe continue on, <laughs> that we can maybe continue on when I invite you to the next hour of the truth. Yes. When I start reading again from Samuel C. Gibb, an understandable history of the Bible, which deals with the King James. But Bible. I think it's important at uh, least to mention it because uh, there are so many people out there that think, oh, the King James Bible is written by the Jesuits. No, 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 no. You got to study history, right? Yeah, the King James Bible is the only Bible that will lead you into the Holy Spirit understanding it. Mm, it's know? a tricky thing, you know, and you can't convince someone of it because it's their conscience that dictates what they do. And that goes to each one of us. Mm. So it's really tricky. <laughs> All right, that's yeah. my comment. Okay. So just making the point that the confessors, who the Jesuits were, they were the master confessors, they played a very, very important role in history. Because of their doing and their knowledge, they actually steered the way things were, ru uh, were running in this world, and still are running in this world. But let's continue in the book now. Let us remember also the part played by the fathers in general politics, even outside the confessional. I think we are hearing now from the author a con, uh, a con uh, how do you say that, uh, confirmation of what I just said. Father Posevino, as pontifical legate in Sweden, Poland and Russia. Father Petre, a minister in England. Father Vota, as intimate counselor of Jean Sobieski of Poland as maker of kings in Poland, as mediator when Prussia was made into a kingdom. One must admit that no other order but the Jesuits showed so much interest and talent for politics and deployed so much activity in it than the Jesuit order. If the indulgence of these confessors towards their august penitents helped greatly the interests of the order and the Roman Curia. It was the same in the more modest spheres where the fathers used similar convenient methods. With their meticulous and even meddlesome spirit, which they inherited from their founder, the famous casuists such as Escobar, Mariana, Sanchez, Busenbaum, etc., applied themselves to studying each rule in particular and their applications to all the cases which could be presented at the Tribunal of Penance. Their tracts on moral theology gave the company a universal reputation as they subtly and distort and per pervert the most evident moral obligations was so apparent. Here are some examples of these acrobatics. Quote, and this is a few quotes that follow right now. The divine law prescribes, you shall not bear false witness. There is false witness only if the one who took the oath uses words which he knows will deceive the judge. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt this right now because I... <laughs> I see where this is coming from, and this is uh, actually written in the constitutions of the Jesuits, mm. who I, which I partially know already. So here are some examples of these acrobatics, just 
repeating that last sentence. The divine law prescribes, you shall not bear false witness. There is false witness only, and that is, of course, the interpretation by man, if the one who took the oath uses words which he knows will deceive the judge. The use of ambiguous terms is of ambiguous terms is therefore allowed and even the excuse of mental reservation in certain circumstances if a husband asks his adulterous wife if she has broken the conjugal contract she can say no without hesitation as that contract still exists once she has obtained absolution at the confessional she can say i am without sin if while she says it, she thinks of that absolution which took the load of her sin. If her husband is still incredulous, she can reassure him by saying that she has not committed adultery, and if she adds under her breath adultery, she is obliged to confess. Unquote. Well, we are speaking here of an example of a woman who betrayed her husband, but I cannot help but think of a husband who betrayed a whole nation with the same mental reservation. Brett, do you want to say the name, or do I have to say the name? <laughs> oh, goodness, I'm not thinking. Uh, go ahead, please. I did not have sexual relationships <laughs> with that woman. Of course, Clinton. William Jefferson Clinton. Yep. Yep, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, of course, Monica Lewinsky. A prime example, if you do not understand what casistry and sophistry and mental reservation is, mm. is the former American president, William Jefferson Clinton, Jesuit trained at Georgetown University. It is not hard to imagine that such a theory was successful with their beautiful penitent ladies. <laughs> no, that is not hard to imagine. In fact, their gallant escorts were treated just as well. The law of God commands, you shall not kill. But it doesn't mean that every man who kills sins against this precept. <laughs> mm. <laughs> For example... For example, if a nobleman is threatened with blows or beating, he can kill his aggressor. But of course, this right is only for the nobleman and not for the plebeian. As there is nothing dishonorable for a common man to receive a beating. Now, let me ask you. First of all, what happened to the Bible expression, do harm to no man? as Jesus commanded. And second of all, according to the Bible, we Christians are all brethren. There is no nobleman and plebeian. That is an invention of the temporal, of the carnal world. They make the distinction. Before Jesus we are all the same. So this only works in a system that makes a distinction between people that the Bible and God does not make in the first place. The problem is, when we play their game, we have to play by their rules. We cannot play their rules or their game, we cannot play their game with God's rules. And that's the big misunderstanding. Mm. Oh, but if you do, then you're double-minded. <laughs> then you serve too much. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's what we're not supposed and to do. And that's what you, uh, what you cannot do. Well, a drunk man can do it pretty easily, I would think. What do you think, Jörg? Well, my point being... I'm just that, joking, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But my point, my point being is that the Jesuits here take an example of if a nobleman is threatened, 
it is something else as if a layman is threatened or a plebeian, mm -hmm. as they call him here. And I just wanted to make the point that when you accept that there is a nobleman and you are just a plebeian, then of course their rules apply. And you cannot come with the rules that you read in the Bible and play their game. Good point. Good point. Yep. In other words, you're you're in compliance with their rules. When you play their game. Yep. Yeah. So just don't play their game. Mm -hmm. Be ye separate, says the Lord. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins mm -hmm. of her sins. Right? right. We are called to not participate in that system of noblemen and plebeians, for example. In that system, everything is about hierarchy and nothing else. Everything is about hierarchy. And everyone who stands above another or thinks of himself that he stands above another, of course, has more rights than the one that he stands on. Could you interpret that as, as going out to vote? Yeah, well, I'm going to play a part of it because I'm a Republican. <laughs> or I'm a Democrat, you know? I don't know. I guess I look at it as, as uh, well, if I'm going to go out and vote, then I'm going to be a part of it, you know? I don't know. Sure, when you go out to vote, you are playing their game. Yeah, I think so. But then one could argue, well, just being a member of society, taking an ID card, you know, you're you're in. You're, but uh, there's a fine line there somewhere. <laughs> anyway, it's a big subject, actually. Yeah, but I just want our listeners to understand the precept that they say that, for exam example, if a nobleman is threatened with blows or beating, mm. he can kill his aggressor because uh, it is nothing dishonorable for a common man to receive a beating. Now, the author continues here, in the same way, a servant who helps his master seduce a young girl is not committing a mortal sin if he can fear serious disadvantages or bad treatment in case he refuses. If a young girl is pregnant, a miscarriage can be induced mm. if her fault is the cause of dishonor for herself or a member of the clergy, mm. means of the church. Mm -hmm. As Father Benzi, he had his hour of fame when he declared, quote, it is only a slight offense to feel the breasts of a nun, unquote. And because of it, the Jesuits were nicknamed the Mammillary Theologians. But as far as this concerns, as far as that this, sorry, but as far as that is concerned, the famous casuist, Thomas Lanches, deserves the prize for his tract De Matrimonio, in which he pious, uh, the pious author studies with outrageous details all the varieties of quote unquote carnal sin. You know, that's also something the Roman Catholic Church is very good in, in uh, making different kinds of sins, mm. where the Bible only speaks of sin or not sin, and they speak of carnal sin, deadly sin, and uh, original sin, and all that stuff. Mm. Uh, something that you never hear in the Bible, of course. Also, let us study further this, these convenient maxims as far as politics are concerned, especially those relative to the legitimacy of assassinating tyrants found guilty of lukewarm towards the sacred interests of the Holy See. Mr. Burma has this to say, quote, and listen carefully. As we have just seen, it is not difficult to guard against mortal sin. Depending on circumstances, we only have to use the excellent means permitted by the fathers equivocation mental reservation the subtle theory of the direction of intentions and we will be able to commit without sin acts which are considered criminal by the ignorant masses but in which even the most severe father will not be able to find an atom 
of mortal sin. Unquote. Amongst the most criminal Jesuitic maxims, there is one which roused public indignation to the highest point and deserves to be examined. It is, a monk or priest is allowed to kill those who are ready to slander him or his community. So the order gives itself the right to eliminate its adversaries, and even those of its members who, having come out of it, are too talkative. This pearl is found in the theology of Father Lamy. There is another case where this principle finds its application. For this same Jesuit was cynical enough to write, quote, If a father, yielding to temptation, abuses a woman and she publicizes what has happened and, because of it, dishonors him, this same father can kill her to avoid disgrace. Unquote. Another son of Loyola quoted, Le Grand Flambeau, Caramuel, thinks that this maxim must be upheld and defended. Quote, the father can use it as an excuse to kill the woman and so preserve his honor. Unquote. This monstrous theory was used to cover many crimes committed by ecclesiastics and probably was in 1956 the reason, if not the cause, for the lamentable affair of the priest of Yuruf. Now, dear listener, you of course have probably no idea, as I did not before I looked it up, what the affair of Yuruf was, or even what Yuruf mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. Yuruf itself is a place that is um, in the north of France, in a region we call Alsac. And that region of Alsace has long time belonged to Germany and then France again and then Germany again and then France again. And now, of course, it belongs to France at the moment. And when you look the case of the priest of Yeruf on the Internet, when you look that up on Wikipedia, it is not possible to find a German explanation for this uh, for this case. It is not possible to find a Dutch explanation of that because when you click on the Dutch language in the page of Wikipedia where you want to read that, it just opens the part where it explains where Yeruf lies and not about the case that I'm just reading to you. Now the case that we were just reading in the book here was that this monstrous theory that a father can use it as an excuse to kill the woman and so preserve his honor, this theory was used to cover many crimes and probably was in 1956 the reason, if not the cause, for the lamentable affair of the priest of Yeruf. Now what was the affair of the priest of Yeruf? The scandal of the priest of Yeruf is a scandal that was in the news in the 50s of last century. It deals with the crime committed by the Catholic priest Guy Desnoyers. A peasant son, Guy Desnoyers, was ordained a priest in 1946. In July 1950 he was appointed parish priest in Yeruf. He was a very active priest and rather appreciated by his parishioners and won fame for organizing young boys of the area to a soccer team. However, at the same time, Guy Desnoyers had relationships with several women. In 1953, he conceived a child with a 15-year-old girl, Michelle L. He persuaded her to give birth secretly and to abandon her child. In, 19, uh, and to abandon her child. in 1956, he had another relationship with Regine Fay, a 19-year-old girl from Yeruf whom he seduced in the theater activities he had created. She also gets pregnant. Desnoyers was able to persuade Regine's father that her lover is a young man of the village gone to Algeria to fight. Regine promised to keep the secret about the father, but she refused to give birth secretly. Now on December 3, 1956, a few times before the expected day of delivery, Guy Desnoyers got frightened and, on the road, shot his mistress in the head. Then he disemboweled her to, a, to do a caesarean and extract the female child which she bore. He baptized, then killed the baby. 
He also slashed the baby's face to obscure a possible resemblance. The day after, he helped to search for the bodies, claiming that he knew the murderer but was unable to expose the murderer because of the obligations imposing, imposed by receiving secret of confessions. But on December 5th, he confessed his crime. On January 26, 1958, he was condemned by the Court of Assises in Nancy to forced labour for life. He was released in August 1978 and he retired in a monastery in Britain. This is quite a story. And the point is that this is only one story that made it into the official papers and a story that today is very much suppressed because look it up the scandal of the priest of Yeruf or use any other search words on the internet and you will not find very much information on this and as I'm saying this is only one case that we are speaking about one that came to light and we all know why Pope Benedict XVI resigned, right? Because of the child molesting pedophilia agenda of the Roman Catholic Church. And that's why he still is in the Vatican, because when he steps outside, then there would be a possibility that the police could get a hold on him. But as long as he's protected by the church, they can't. They are all protected by the church. I mean, you just heard it. This uh, Guy Desnoyers was sentenced to labor for life. But he was released in August 78. So that's for 20 years that he sat there for labor for life. And then he retired in a monastery in Brittany. There is no justice from the Roman Catholic Church. There is no justice in the system of Antichrist. Mm. And I think this was a prime example. Mm -hmm. And also because we are approaching an hour of broadcast, I think that it is better to finish this right here. It was interesting. It was shorter than I planned. But on the other hand, if we're going to continue now, we are doing two or three hours at once, and I think that is a little bit too much. But I very much like the reading of the morals of the Jesuits, and I hope that Brett will join me another time uh, with the continuation of the reading of the book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. And um, thank you, Brett, for coming, and uh, I'm looking forward to some closing remarks. Thank you, yes, and that, uh, that's a very interesting uh, article and, and shocking because uh, <clears throat> certainly the, uh, the uh, church and its uh, immoral um, actions are reflected everywhere around the globe here. In the, in the world, and uh, there's no exception here. Um, there's a huge scandal going on here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where I grew up, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, it um, maybe it's a uh, divine warning from, from our Lord that, uh, you know, we're dealing with the Antichrist. So... On that note, yeah, the Antichrist is here. Yeah, he is. The Antichrist is a woman, alive and alive well. Alive and well. It is the Roman Catholic Church. It is not some future Antichrist who will come just seven years before Jesus Christ returns. That's right, and we got to be reminded of that. And if that means that these scandals continue, then that means that uh, people are not acknowledging the truth. I mean, well, that's something new. It's a reflection of it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You know, everybody considers honesty a virtue, but nobody wants to hear the truth. Like that. <laughs> Isn't that the case? But uh, I'm very glad to join you again, Jurk, and I look forward to the future here, provided that uh, 
we have a uh, internet to come to and a home <laughs> and uh, things continue the way they've continued for the past years. I think we, we should be able to, to finish this book. And uh, thank you for inviting me in and bye-bye for now. Okay. Thank you, Brett. And uh, dear listeners, okay, um, this was uh, this very short section on the morals of the Jesuits, where actually on the morals of the Jesuits you can write complete, not books, but complete libraries, actually on the missing of the morals, because they do everything to say that they have morals, when actually when you meet them on the standard, which is the Bible, they do not have any morals at all. Thank you very much for watching and listening and I hope to see you next time for the sixth recording of uh, The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. And until then, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you. Signing off and bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, Throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and, and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle, myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.